Hello everyone, you're very welcome to the latest iteration of the PhD Research Video Podcast Series. I'm delighted today to be joined by Owen Walsh. Owen is in the Centre for Research Training in Foundations of Data Science here at the University of Limerick. Uh, Owen is uh, from Kilkenny in the southeast of Ireland and Owen, you're very, very welcome to today's uh, PhD Research Video Podcast Series. Delighted to have you. Thanks for having me, Joe. Uh, yeah. Looking forward to it. Great, great pleasure to have you. And Owen, I'm just going to ask you just to start off, could you give us a, a little bit of background about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so as you mentioned, I, I'm from County Kilkenny. Um, so I'm from a rural area in North County Kilkenny uh, called Liz Downey. Um, so I would have grown up there. I would have gone to primary school in the area, um, but in a very small school, typical of a rural area. So there would have been only about 50 students in the school. Um, but a lot of my um, interest, I suppose, in science and technology would have come from my primary school days because we, we did uh, a lot of it compared to most primary schools. Um, we would have, you know, gone to the Young Scientist exhibition, done little projects. Um, yeah, it would have been monitoring the weather or stuff like that. So we, we always kind of had an interest and I suppose that all came from our school principal. He, he was very much interested in science and technology. So that, that's kind of where my interest in all of this kind of stuff started uh, so data science now at the moment but it all started there um, so after that then I would have gone to secondary school in Kilkenny City so I would have gone to school in St Kieran's College um, which probably has more of a focus on the hurling side of things <laughs> um, uh, which I didn't say no to I, I, I like to I like the hurling too so I think most of my school days were focused on the study of hurling rather than the study of science and technology <laughs> but, uh, yeah um, but near the end of school then, um, coming up to the Leaving Cert, so I suppose I started thinking about what I wanted to do after school. And um, I'd always been good at, at uh, you know, maths, physics, science subjects. Um, very numerical individual, I suppose. Maybe not as good as at, at English and languages and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I decided I wanted to do a degree in, in something numerical and I chose a degree in physics. Um, so I went to University of Limerick then. Um, after school and undertook a, a degree in uh, applied physics in Limerick and um, yeah I've, I loved it absolutely loved it it was hard work but I really enjoyed it and uh, yeah near the end of my degree then I, I done a, a few modules that I quite enjoyed um, relating to maybe uh, computer programming and stuff like that and uh, yeah now, now I'm here doing a PhD in data science so that's yeah, a quick and... synopsis of, my, of me <laughs> Excellent. And what was it that made you then decide to do a PhD on? Um, so in third and fourth year uh, of my degree, I started doing a lot of computer programming. So we did a module uh, in computer programming in third year, so scientific computing. And um, I really enjoyed it. I loved it. And um, I, I thought I wanted to get more exposure to it. So I did my final year project um, in that same area. So I spent most of my fourth year um, doing scientific program programming as well and I really really enjoyed it I enjoyed the challenge of it and I enjoyed sol solving problems in that area uh, and so on um, and my final year project supervisor mentioned that the Centre for Research Training and uh, Foundations of Data Science was being uh, put forward as a possible opportunity and yeah I, I applied to that um, I applied to other things too you know I applied for jobs and so on I didn't just silo myself to one single thing but I I, I, I kind of knew I wanted to do something in the uh, in the research side of things because I'm quite an in inquisitive individual you know I'm curious I don't I'm comfortable enough with not knowing what's going on and trying to figure it out and uh, yeah I, I'm also aware then that data science is a, is a growth area so you know it opens a lot of doors and you know it's applicable across research domains and industry domains basically anywhere there's data, you know, a data scientist can uh, apply themselves. Uh, so yeah, I, I kind of knew it was a, a good career opportunity to go down this road and then combined with the fact that I like problem solving and and I'm happy enough not knowing what's going on. So I can kind of work my way around problems and stuff. Yeah, excellent. And tell us Owen, um, the Center for um, uh, Research Training in uh, Foundations of Data Science that was established relatively recently, was it not? Yes. So it would have been. I would have been in the first cohort. Yeah. So I'm in second year now. Um, so my year would have been the first year of it, um, and it, it, it's across three institutions. So it's the University of Limerick, 
um, University College Dublin, UCD and Maynooth University. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like a, there's 27 students in my year. So we kind of have this cohort based approach to a PhD when typically it would have been a very kind of individual uh, journey. You know, you'd apply with a supervisor and um, you'd apply for funding with a specific supervisor and then that would be your project and you'd work with them and they might have a group of students or whatever and that would kind of be your cohort maybe. Or if this is more like we all applied together and we had a rough idea of what we wanted to do for our PhD, but we didn't have to decide until maybe seven or eight months in. And there were a number of modules and master classes and stuff like that where we got to bond together and there were some symposiums and so on. So there's a real kind of a family, I suppose, dynamic to it, which is nice. Um, and it's good to have a support system in PhDs too, because they can be quite well, from what I've heard, they can be quite lonely, you know, especially when it gets kind of tough. Um, so it's nice to have that support system and you can bounce ideas off people. Great. So do you have a lot of modules? Do you have, say, like classes or replacement or how does oh, it work? Yeah, in, it, there's, yeah, there's a number of um, there's a number of different, I suppose, things that are different to a typical PhD. So, well, most PhDs now would have the um, structured PhD element where you do five modules. Mm -hmm. So we would have done five uh, modules in first year. So we would have done, done a number of data science and computer programming ones. And then we would have done more um, software modules too, to do with entrepreneurship and research impact. So it's nice to get that blend. Uh, and I suppose they would have more to do with how, how a researcher might um, take their technical research and then, you know, apply it in, um, in society or in industry or even just how to disseminate it properly so that it gets the most uh, reach and impact into the future, um, which is important. You know, there's, uh, there's it's one thing doing the science, but probably the most important thing is disseminating it, because what good is it if it can't be applied um, in other groups or in industries and stuff where it can make an, an impact? You know, that's kind of the end goal of a lot of this, you know? Yeah, great stuff. And could you tell us, Owen, at the moment, you know, um, what you're what you're working on um and you know and what's the next big milestone for you in terms in terms of your of your phd yeah sure um so my focus is within data science is machine learning so machine learning applied to microscopy so i work out of the physics department in ul so the bernal institute um and there's a large electron microscope um within the uh, bernal institute so microscopes are used just to look at nano nanoscale objects, so extremely small objects uh, and specimens and crystals and so on. Um, and then machine learning is um, in effect harnessing a few different areas. So we have computer uh, computing power, um, we have mathematical algorithms, and then we just have lots of data. So it's kind of a it's a modern thing because with the internet and with um, new generations of machinery, there is a lot of data out there. And also then computing power has reached a stage where it can crunch this data and provide insights from it. Um, now the maths behind it has been there um, for a long time, but it's been it's now applicable because of this computing power and this large amount of data. So the problem that I'm, I suppose, tackling is in order to harness these machine learning algorithms, you need good data sets. So first you need a lot of data. Secondly, the data needs to be, in a lot of cases, it needs to be well labeled. Not all cases, but in a lot of cases, it needs to be labeled data. So what do I mean by that? So if I had a, if I had an image of a cat, say, uh, a cat within some photograph, and we wanted to label that image. So what we want to do is basically say, where in the image is the cat? So what pixels are cat? What pixels are not cat within the image? And, and this, this sounds like a tedious problem because um, at the moment, there's a lot of applications out there where you actually have to, uh, you know, they just sit down and manually label these things. You know, there's online programs to do it where you label the image, so label where the cat is. And that's that's tedious, it's a lot of work, mm. and you'd rather a better solution. Um, no, obviously, in my case, I'm not looking at cats. There, there are other objects, but uh, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, in effect, then. What, what we have done is we've created something that allows us to create data that looks extremely similar to the real data. So synthetic data in effect. And this allows us to train the algorithms because when we create the synthetic image, 
we can then label it as well automatically using our computer program. So as we generate the image, we generate the corresponding mask and it's very neat. It gives us a lot of control over the data. So that's, that's pretty much what I'm working on. Um, so what's the next big milestone? Um, we're coming to the end, I suppose, of a, a project at the moment. So hopefully I'll begin to write up a paper in, in the not so distant future over the summer. Um, and that, that's probably, that's a big milestone in any PhD, you know, your first uh, stab at disseminating your work and yeah. going through that process of writing, which I've heard is uh, not easy, but we'll see, I suppose. Excellent. And nothing to do with cats in the writing process. No, 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 no. no, all, no. All, to with, all to do with mics and stuff. Yeah, no. yeah. I think that might be your Kilkenny background coming yeah, through there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> unconscious <laughs> bias for cats there, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So I think you've probably answered, you know, the next question there, Owen, which would be, or partly answered it at least, you know, so which is about what would a typical day working on your PhD consist of? You know, and, and would you be able to just give us a bit of background? Because I know you started, say, pre-pandemic. You would have mm. been, say, in, in the University of Limerick for about six months, I reckon, before the pandemic yeah. struck right. and before we all had to, you know, um, ev I won't say evacuate, but before we all had to uh, clear out of the, of, the, <laughs> of the university. So how does that compare, you know, that experience pre-pandemic and post-pandemic in terms of your own typical working day on, a, on, a, on, your, on your research? Yeah, I mean, it's, I would say, at, so, Pre-pandemic, it would have been, you know, you get up, you go into the office, you go about your work day, you might go to the gym, go for a run or whatever in the evening. You know, you have a pretty structured day, but uh, the one thing that you would take for granted is that you meet other people and that you meet your colleagues, your friends, uh, and you collaborate with people face to face. Um, so since the pandemic struck then, you know, it's a lot of this, you know, it's a lot of Zoom calls, a lot of Teams meetings, and it's not it's not quite the same thing, you know. it's. Uh, as much as people might say, sure, you have all these resources, it can't be that bad. There is something about meeting in person that is completely different. You know, you don't get the whole body language side of things and just feeling like you're there with other people. You know, it feels, I would say even, in fact, that I think Zoom meetings and Teams meetings um, tire people out and they can be quite draining and stressful. Whereas in person, it's not like that and it never would be like that. It's very kind of relaxed. So that's definitely a big difference I've noticed. My typical day then, like I would get up of bed obviously around, I don't know, half seven. <laughs> and the morning time is kind of where I do most of my problem solving. I'm kind of a morning type of person, so I, yeah. I get most of my work where I want to like develop something new or fix something in the morning time. Okay. Um, in the last semester or two then, you'd have teaching online. So, you know, I'd be teaching using a tablet, doing tutorials or whatever, uh, which I quite like. Um, and then in the afternoon, it's more like a lot. There'll be more meetings. Um, I do a bit of writing on what I've done, so I keep track of what's going on every day. And then a, a lot of reading too. So I would say the, the bulk of the creative work is done in the morning while I'm a bit fresh. And then it's hard to switch off in the evening at the moment because I'm, I'm working out of my room, like a lot of people. So your work is right there beside you. Uh, in the evening time, so it's kind of hard to switch off. You kind of have to shut the laptop and just walk away from the songs, the discipline itself, you know. Sure. And tell us, how does it work now? Say, with you mentioned that there's a cohort and a strong bond between you all. How has that been affected by the pandemic, or has it changed? Has that dynamic changed somewhat? Well, I live with two of them, so that's not too bad. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, there's there's a few others, yeah, who you wouldn't you wouldn't see regularly. Um, but in fairness, the the um directors and Janet Clifford, the manager of the program, have made a, an effort to do Zoom calls in the different institutions, um, once a week so that people can catch up, and that that's great. You know, it's, it's a small thing, but at least you keep in contact. Um, and it's the best you can do in the situation that we're in. Um, but hopefully now with everyone getting vaccinated. Um, maybe towards the end of the summer, towards the start of next semester, we can start seeing each other in person again. And that would be nice, you know. Oh, it would. And tell us on oh, just about, um, so I, I suppose you've been, what, about um, 18, 19 months in, on your PhD program. Uh, so have you encountered any, you know, major challenges or problems so far? And if you have, you know, would you be able to describe or give one instance of one of those challenges and how you confronted it and in fact even 
perhaps overcame it also. Yeah, so I was talking about how what we're doing is kind of generating synthetic data. Um, so near the start, I suppose it would have been this time last year, maybe maybe February of 2020, so about 14 months ago, um, I was starting out with my actual PhD project. Um, and I had, I had the general research question, you know, of what we were trying to do. So we were ta trying to tackle a low data problem, you know, not a lot of data, not a lot of labeled data. And we wanted to tackle that. And there are a number of like esoteric um, machine learning techniques for generating like data for compared to real data. Um, and we were going down that road and I was all machine learning, machine learning, machine learning. I need to find a problem within machine learning. And this is going on, I'd say, for about six or seven weeks. And we were making small progress, but probably not the progress we wanted to see. You know, it didn't feel like we were making groundbreaking progress. Um, I would say, and a lot of the methods used are hard to hard to gauge. There's not a real intuition to them. There isn't a whole lot of control over them, you know. Um, without getting into too much detail, but um, what I, I remember is we we do regular group meetings, and I remember one of the other guys in the group had looked around and to see how we could replicate these images. Specifically, how could we re replicate the background of these images? They had a very specific kind of uh, characteristic and we couldn't nail down what it was. And he went away and looked around in um, different fields completely from what we were doing and found something. And I mean, when I say it looked exactly the same, it literally looked exactly the, the, the background that we were able to generate using this new technique from a separate field was uh, exactly the same. Wow. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, and what, and what, field, what field was that on? Um, it was, uh, it would have been from gaming and uh, what would you say, special effects and stuff okay. like that, which is interesting. Yeah, uh, very interesting. Uh, at the time, I couldn't believe it. It was mind blowing, actually. And um, not only that, but it was very easy to reproduce and control this uh, background. So it was really nice um, control over it. I could easily understand what was going on and control how to change it and make changes that I would like and so on, which, which was really nice. And um, yeah, there was a lot of lessons learned from that. I mean, you know, you kind of learn firstly that you can't ever get siloed in these things, mm. you know. Um, you might be going down a very narrow track in a very specific field, but you never know how other fields can contribute to your yeah. work. Like, um, And not only that then, but also the fact that talking to other people is so important, you know, getting a fresh perspective. Um, you know, uh, the other guy in the group, David, you know, he, he, he offered that fresh perspe perspective and it, it's worked out really well. Um, so that would be kind of my my advice, I suppose, if anyone had a problem, is fresh perspectives are so important. Um, it doesn't even it doesn't even have to be talking to a person. You could read an article, read other papers, even walk away from your work for a few days, uh, leave it alone. You might come up with a fresh perspective yourself in the back of your own mind. The mind is strange. So, yeah, it's it's a uh, definitely a lesson I learned. I'm glad I learned it early because I've definitely used it since in other problems, smaller problems. But yeah, definitely have used it a few different times. Great. And Owen, you talked earlier uh, in this interview about impact, you know, and the importance of impact of your research. What do you, what would you see as the potential impact of your own research uh, that you're undertaking? Yeah, so the, the group, um, the group goal, I suppose. So my supervisor and we've just four PhD students. Yeah, four PhD students at the moment and a fifth one coming in in September. The goal at the moment is to effectively automate from start to finish, um, an electron microscope and its workflow. So what does that mean? I suppose it means, um, can we automate um, the experimental design process? So what we want to do with the microscope, firstly, can we work that out on a computer using simulations and so on? Can we then um, um, augment the microscope to our liking? So adjust this, make adjustments to various things in it, like the lenses and so on. Um, automatically using machine learning and so on. Uh, and then can we analyze the data using machine learning and computing tools? So in effect, we just want to automate from start to finish an electron microscope, which would be quite a big deal mm. because it would free up um, it would free up a lot of uh, bandwidth in people's heads for actually figuring out problems and make thinking of applications. And, you know, instead of spending all their time trying to get the information and analyzing the data, they can actually free up some space in their heads to actually 
use the tools as a tool and then uh, do science on the side based on what the results are in a quicker fashion. It would speed up speed up the workflow in effect, um, which would be nice. And I suppose my role within that would be the, the analysis side of it at the moment anyway. So when the data comes out of the microscope, can we harness machine learning to give us information from the images pretty much straight away? And that that's that's my segment in it. And other guys in the group have their own little projects working on this overall goal. No, that's great because you can very much see what the you know potential impact there of it could be. And that's 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 fascinating. That's great. So in terms of your own career own, where would you see you know your own career aspirations? Would you see it in academia or industry or it's, yeah it's, you know, or... it's hard to know Joe. i mean it's uh it's great to have options to put it that way mm -hmm. um you know I, I how did i i ended up in the phd because i just followed my intuition in a lot of ways i kind of said i like this i like doing whatever um i'm not really you know it's not exactly financially rewarding doing a phd you would say you know it's not like a typical job where you might be earning whatever 30 20, 20 to 30, you know, grand. Um, but that that's not the point. You know, you're kind of doing something you like. You're willing to take the hit because you're doing something you like. And I, I really enjoy it. And that'll probably be my ethos going forward. If doors open and I um, and I enjoy what I might be doing, I'll probably do that. Now, there might be other pressures in the future that might dictate I can't do that. But we'll see. You know, um, I wouldn't say no to a career in academia. Um, I wouldn't say no to other things either. I'd like to, you know, I'd like to travel. I'd like to go see the world. So maybe there's probably good options because data science is a pretty broad field. So there's there's a range of places you could probably go with it because the skills are applicable mm. across domains. Yeah. You know, absolutely. And uh, no aspirations to continue what you began in St. Cairns and Kilkenny, the study of hurling. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm still, I'm still at it. I'm still at it. I still, I still hurling. Um, that, that's my first love, always will be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great stuff. And so I, I, I just have a couple more questions. So one would be about, um, you know, doing a PhD. You said there about, you know, the world of work and. Uh, Doing a PhD and like the the advantage, perhaps you know, to yourself of doing a a PhD. Um, so, what advice would you give to someone you know who's thinking of doing a PhD? Yeah, like it, it's uh, it's a tough um, decision to make. I would say. Um, I remember when I was making the decision, it wasn't easy because you hear. I would say you hear a lot of horror stories. Um, which is unfortunate, I think, because I've had a great experience. I've absolutely loved it. Um, but I would say that you have to follow, well, you have to firstly understand, do you like what you're going to do? There's no, I would say doing a PhD is not about prestige um, or, you know, money or anything like that. You have to really, really like what you're going to do. You have to like the process and the process is in effect. You fail pretty much every day. You have problems to solve every day. There's a new problem. It's like an en endless wave of problems. Even mm -hmm. when you publish a paper, a good paper produces more problems mm -hmm. in reality. Yeah. Um, so you have to be comfortable with that. You just have to like what you're doing. Um, the best way to gauge that, I suppose, would be most people do some sort of a final year project um, in fourth year or some equivalent, depending on what institution you're in. And the best way to gauge it is, did you like doing your final year project? So did you like the process of doing the literature review? Did you like reading up on what work mm -hmm. you were doing? Um, did you like uh, the problem solving process, you know, the experimental process, writing? Did you like all those things? Did you like the presenting of your work? Did you like to tell other people what you were doing for your final year project? Um, and that's that's probably the best asset test for knowing if you want to do one or not. Because in effect, it's the same thing just over a longer period of time. Um, and it's quite, it's really enjoyable. If you, if you, if you like what you're doing, it's really enjoyable. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and you love that process of you know generating and creating new knowledge. Absolutely, well. yeah, yeah, and um, that's simply it's like fixing. It's like uh, it's an iterative process where you chip away at something pretty much mm -hmm. for day after day, and over six months, those days make something quite large. Um, but day to day, you might see nothing, but add up all those small little bits of progress, and those little problem solved and adds up to something nice, which. Which is quite rewarding at the end of this, definitely. You know, I'm only two years in, so it's two years to go. Um, maybe I'll have a horror story in two, <laughs> next two years. Who knows? Uh, but uh, 
that's part of it too, you know. I don't think everything is plain sailing in life. So if you're not facing problems or feeling uncomfortable, you're probably doing something wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, somebody at uh, a workshop I was at last week, somebody described research as messy. You know, that it's 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 a messy process, you know. It's Absolutely, not, yeah. It's not yeah. linear. It's not going to be. Not you know, at all. You, you could make huge you're progress. You're not going to begin in chapter one and then, you know, continue yeah. on in a yeah. linear fashion. Exactly. You can make huge progress in one week and make no progress for a month. Mm. That's significant. But you have to yeah. go through that process in order to get that next big jump, you know. Yes. Yeah, that's great advice. And so how would you describe, say, your time here at the University of Limerick, Owen? How's it been? You know, you said you began here as an undergraduate. Yeah, I, I loved it. I absolutely love Castle Troy. Um, the college is really, really nice. Um, you know, I've, I've made loads of friends. Um, it's, a really, it's a really nice atmosphere. Um, it's, it's quite suitable for me, too. You know, I came from Kilkenny, so Kilkenny wouldn't have its own institution or anything like that. So it's probably the closest one. You know, if you go, if you go to... Dublin or whatever, just high rent and so on. And the rent down here is quite good. I know that's probably not not exactly the uh, the question, but you know it, it contributes to all these things. I mean, you know, the rent is nice. I do think there's a great community atmosphere. Um, I've made loads of friends, as I said, and I really enjoyed what I did. Um, and, and that's all you can ask for, really. You know, uh, the campus is absolutely amazing. You know, it's definitely the nicest campus in the country from what I've seen. I'm not biased at all in saying that. <laughs> It is definitely yeah. one of the nicest ones I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. No. Great stuff. And just one last question, then, on just about the cohort basis. You know, for the PhD, how do you think that's working out? You know, you said it's very interesting. There, you're uh, doing the kind of interinstitutional. Uh, yeah. You're doing PhD on an inter interinstitutional basis within the center, um, uh, the Center for Research Training and Foundations of Data Science. So. How would you describe how that's working? Because that that's relatively new, you know, in terms. I mean, just uh, in terms of um, national policy, that's that's a relatively new concept, you know. This yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's you really, know tripartite approach to the PhD. Absolutely, yeah, and it's a really nice idea because it immediately forces you to look outside of your own uh, blinkered region. Mm. So, say, like I'm working in UL, so therefore I'll interact with people from UL a lot of the time. But it kind of forces you to you know, talk to people in Minute, talk to people in UCD. Now, I would say we probably haven't seen the full benefit of that because of the pandemic. Yep. We did have a symposium last year, uh, January, January 2020, and it was brilliant. You know, we had group projects that we did in groups within our institutions, but then we all came together, presented our group projects, um, did, um, did networking with the industry partners. And that's actually something I probably didn't mention. Like we go on an industry placement. So I, I, I did an industry placement last summer with um, Met Aaron, um, which was brilliant. And I've got, I've got so many, done so many rewarding things because of that, you know, presentations, um, conferences and so on. Even if they are online, it's great, great practice. And they, they've been brilliant to me. Um, but yeah, the cohort based thing is really good for kind of forcing you to uh, you know, learn what other people are doing, present what you're doing to them, and you also make friends then along the way. And as I said before, fresh perspectives. This is like a easy, handed to you on a plate way of getting a fresh perspective on what you're doing and on what other people are doing. Yeah. So I imagine that when you said oh, that you were working for Meteor and the Irish Meteorological Service, I imagine that you were plagued with the uh, requests for updates on the weather <laughs> well the, the joke started straight away the joke started straight away. i was the weatherman for about 12 weeks there yeah yeah pretty much there sure. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i know it was a brilliant experience but they're they're, they're excellent and met is a special it's a special industry partner i would say uh because it's i was working within a research group and a lot of them would have come from academia backgrounds, so they understand um, the importance yeah. of getting off the ground fast in a 12 week uh, time slot. You know, you can't get a lot done in 12 weeks unless you know exactly what you're going to do. Yeah. And um, they were excellent that way. They had a well planned and I think we got some good work done in the time I was there. OK, fantastic. So Owen, Owen Walsh, uh, thanks. I'll just say uh, that it's a real pleasure talking to you and I'll wish you all the best in your in fact, really, really fascinating talking to you today about your work within the uh, physics department in the uh, Centre for Research Training and Foundations of Data Science here at the University of Limerick. So that's really fantastic. So I wish you all the all the very best. I'm not going to wish you, you know, uh, 
perpetual. Su- I don't want to make any of those corny uh, weather-based jokes. You know, like, <laughs> you know long-lasting I, sunshine yeah. in your in your in your PhD or anything yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as ridiculous as that. But uh, I wish you all the very best, Owen, in whatever. Uh, career path you decide to take after your PhD. I'm sure you'll have a glittering career in whatever field, uh, whichever area you choose to um, uh, specialise in. So thank you very, very much, Owen, and all the best to say with your PhD and with your future career. So thanks. Thank great you, pleasure thanks to talk for having to you. me on. Yeah, great. Thanks very much, Owen. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.